Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. It's in the mid-30s Fahrenheit temperature. We've got some sun. We've got a couple inches of snow on Thursday night. Thank you for joining us today. The local time on a Saturday morning is 8.52, and we will begin our program called Oceanic Plateaus at the top of the hour. I got to do a couple of quick things here on my laptop and then we'll get rolling, okay? Thank you for your patience. Okay, I got all sorts of stuff going on here, trying to keep it all straight. Um, are we five by five, especially with Lappy, the lapel mic? And uh, also, where are you viewing from? Good morning, Patrick, age eight. Here's to you. Baltimore, Maryland, Freeland, Wisconsin, Mill Creek, Washington. Good morning from Cornell. That must have been Myra. Uh, Oh boy, let me scroll back here. Uh, Baker, California, Ken, hello. Garrett, the Dutch night owl. Mac is uh, there. Dirk from Auburn, Washington, USA. Hi, Rex from Woodenville, Washington. AZ is in Portland, Oregon. Ah, uh, boy. All sorts of great places here. Lunchtime, says John in Pennsylvania. The lappy sounds good. Thank you, Mike, for the report. Um, I got to quit saying um, by the way. I'm trying hard to do uh, Looking for exotic locations, of course. Ray, Half Moon Bay, California. Marin in uh, Bellevue, Idaho. Lindsay says lappy sounds good. Thank you. Uh, Elaine, Elaine is in Tucson. Blodgett, Oregon. Uh, Minna is in Finland. Hello. Ed is in Manitoba, Canada. I'm still back a ways, just trying to get this uh, live chat to calm down a little bit. Martha's Vineyard, Massachusetts. Uh, wonderful. Carmel, Indiana. Nanaimo, British Columbia. That's Leah Gold. Hi, Leah. Brooklyn, New York. That's Peter. Northern Ontario. That's Bergen. Uh, I think I'm kind of close to live now. Skipping Rock, Ohio. Huntington Beach, California. Bose in Copenhagen, Denmark. Mankano, Minnesota. F, uh, whoop, too fast. Oh, come on, I got to get that. Tuscadero. Hi, Claudia. Or words to that effect. Kathy from Brisbane, Australia. Hello, Kathy. Have a good one. Devorah from Seattle, Washington. Heard of it. Todd from Santa Clemente, California. Here's to you, Todd, in that ball cap of yours. Netherlands, Saskatoon, Hayward, probably California, maybe Wisconsin. Um, um, Manchester, UK, Marblehead, Massachusetts. I don't know. I'm having fun reading these for some reason. I only got three minutes, but. Um, <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, Facebook Live is working. Thank you, Pat. I, I kind of for, I guess that was just a one-time setting, and it'll just kind of do it each time. I I don't think it affects us here, except there's a few people who only are on Facebook, and they get a chance to be aware of these programs. Adventure Brada from Waikile, Hawaii. Boy, it's early there, huh? Six in the morning, maybe. I don't know, seven in the morning? Okay. Um, I've got a couple of new things I'm working on. And uh, we're good there. Mostly it's the chalkboard. Uh, just you, me, and the chalkboard. 
I got three minutes. How many we got? Almost 500. Okay, now. Okay. I guess the weekends are, are working for many. Southport, UK. Um, Barbara says, Colorado isn't exotic enough. Hi, gang. JJ Beck is in Weed, California, in the shadow of Mount Shasta. Sven is uh, 6 p.m. in Germany. Hello, Sven. Let's see. I've got this bad feeling like I'm forgetting to do something, but I, I, think, I think I'm actually okay. I, uh, we got students in the building this morning. That shocked me. I'm usually here by myself at this hour, but I saw Ben, the grad student at the copy maker, and I saw two other students. One, I couldn't even remember her name. <laughs> of course, you got the mask, so you can't even tell. But the doors are sealed. I got, I got signs on the doors. Please do not interrupt live streaming. I didn't think I'd have to do that at freaking 9 o'clock on a Saturday morning, but I guess I do. We got bodies. Bodies floating around. Butte Hole. Had to read that uh, carefully. Butte Hole, Wyoming. Smiley face. Okay. Well, I'm so glad that you're with us. Big Smooth appears to be operating. Uh, if Big Smooth, the camera, does not operate correctly, uh, I don't know how to change it on the fly anyway, so we'll just keep our fingers crossed that way. And uh, if, if you're feeling like, I guess I'll just check Lappy one more time. I'm back here with Lappy. I'm still talking into Lappy, Lappy the lapel mic. So we got Big Smooth and Lappy working just fine. If we do, I'm going to... Take a moment to get my head straight. Lappy still happy. Five by five. Okay. Hot damn. Let's do it. We will start the program in one minute. Thank you for joining us this morning. Or this afternoon. Or this evening. Or tomorrow morning. Or whatever the heck. It's a global audience. I still can't believe it. I really can't believe it, but I'm so glad you're here. Hot mic. You know, uh, I got to go look at my notes. Excuse me, I got to go look at my notes. Okay, good morning everybody. We are beginning. Students around the world, thank you for being here live. We have uh, 600 plus and those numbers will continue to grow as people kind of filter in. And then there will be thousands more watching this in replay and I've been noticing that many of you have been watching in replay to kind of do your homework before you're ready for the next letter. So we were early in our series of crazy Eocene. That crazy Eocene, A to Z, this is only our third session, uh, but we're already kind of digging into some decent stuff. It's not just review and kind of broad table setting. I think we're a little bit more aggressive, and I hope it wasn't too much for you last time. If, you, if that was too fast and you didn't see the exotic series last fall, you're like, I, this is too much. I can't do it. Well, maybe today we'll feel a little better. I don't know. And speaking of that, let me give you a quick uh, programming note before we begin. Uh, let me turn off my emails here. I got emails. I get a, a hundred emails every day. Um, I've commented on this before. Uh, I can't keep up, uh, but I, I mentioned that, first of all, just because I'm closing my email and I, I don't have to hear these notifications. But I was working on this thing last night at, I don't know, 8 p.m., dark, foggy. I'm upstairs in our house. And, and I'm working on stuff, and I'm getting email from Australia. 
20 minutes goes by. Email comes in from Germany. 20 minutes goes by, 30 minutes goes by. Email from South Africa. With ideas for analogies for oceanic plates. I mean, just, just that alone. You, know, you just look up and like, what's this email? It's like from another country. And they're all watching the replays and sharing ideas. So thank you for all, to all of you who came up with all sorts of pet ideas and, and analogies. Of course, I'm not going to use most of them. I can only use a few. And I, there's a couple we'll use today. But for the most part, um, I'm still thinking about, okay. So thank you for the, for the contributions. Okay. Thank you for the participation, in other words. Uh, so on schedule, we do these Saturday mornings and Wednesday afternoons, the whole winter, right? So the next session will be the next session will be session D. I'm pretty sure it's going to be called Docking Silesia, and that will be on schedule Wednesday at 2 p.m. And that's November 24th. So I'll see you all then, either live or in replay. But many of you know that here in the States we have a holiday called Thanksgiving. And it's my favorite holiday of the year. And everybody's coming home. They'll all be arriving late Wednesday afternoon. Our three boys and significant others and friends and the whole thing. So I am not broadcasting a week from this morning. I hope you understand. And then uh, once we're done with the Thanksgiving weekend here in the States, uh, we'll be back to business uh, the following Wednesday at 2 p.m. And uh, something with Rangelia question mark, I'm not sure. But this is the schedule, which is normal, except for I'm taking a break next weekend for Thanksgiving holidays. All right. Well, let's get into it. Let's get into it. Previously on Falcon Crest, in other words, in session B, we were talking about oceanic plateaus, just briefly. And I want to spend today talking more about them, but maybe not as much as you were hoping for. Maybe you wanted to talk about mantle plumes around the world and why mantle plumes exist, hotspots in other words, and, and, and bolide impacts and uh, antipodal whatever. Uh-uh. You know, I don't exactly know what I'm going to do with these sessions until I actually sit down and try to write out a little plan. And as I was thinking and writing and um, communicating with other geologists that I'll tell you about in a second, um, I kind of have a spin on this where we're not going to spend the whole time specifically with oceanic plateaus. So what is the plan? Um, large igneous provinces, have you heard that phrase before? That's new-ish in the last 20, 30 years. Large igneous provinces, LIPs, LIPs. So we're going to talk a little bit about the background of studying large igneous provinces and realizing we have these LIPs, these large igneous provinces in the ocean, a.k.a. oceanic plateaus. And we are going to typically, I don't think it's controversial, to associate large igneous provinces with mantle plumes. And mantle plumes are also called geologic hotspots. So that is our first act. Our second act is to come up with a couple of pet names. Of course, it involves food. I, out of all the hundreds and hundreds of, you know, suggestions, you know, how about three stooges and the... Uh, train wrecks and uh, bells and circles and uh, circuses and all these creative ideas. You know, three movements in a symphony. And uh, how about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? I'm not kidding. Maybe they were kidding. <laughs> so out of all that, I think at least one person in the live chat for session B, when I was talking about a German chocolate cake underwater in the ocean and having seawater soaking into that cake, Somebody said sponge cake, and I like it. I had to Google sponge cake to make sure that I, that was a thing that I was visualizing, and I think it is. So I think our oceanic plateaus casually are going to be called sponge cakes. And there's a distinction then between German chocolate cakes and sponge cakes, and we'll make sure you can see that uh, early on. But then there's an idea of chocolate gummy worms. You know what a gummy worm is, and uh, I'll explain. And then the third act is uh, studying Vancouver Island because Vancouver Island has not only one of our LIPs, our LIPs, our large igneous provinces, our chocolate sponge cakes that now is out of the ocean, but the southern tip of Vancouver Island uh, has another one. So both Rangelia and Silesia 
are exposed on Vancouver Island. So I want to take a little time, like I know anything about Vancouver Island, but I want to take a little time um, to visit that island the best we can. That's the plan today. Hope you're feeling up for it. Let's do it. Dancing with the chalkboards. This one's going away for now. And let's bring in some notes that I've written for myself. Whoa! That was a uh, collision. That was a chalkboard. Maybe each, maybe each oceanic plateau should be a chalkboard. Just kidding. All right. So, to review very quickly, we were talking about three oceanic plateaus in the nucleus of a super terrain. Do you recall? I mixed it up last time, remember? Intermontane super terrain, insular super terrain. I'm not going to really use those, those labels this winter. We were using that a lot last time, last winter. But this winter, I want to just use these names here. So these are our three large igneous provinces, a uh, question mark. And remember the three big dates we had. And again, you had your, you had your pet ideas for something happening three times. 170 million years ago, 100 million years ago, and 50 million years ago. These are the dates of accretion. Those are the dates that, that these things hit and docked. Remember docking and slicing? So the docking, these are the docking dates. And I'm just still trying to remind you. So Rangelia, which we will be studying today a fair amount more. Uh, was built quickly between 230 and 225 million years ago. That's the sponge cake. I was to hesitate now. I don't want to call it a pound cake. What's the difference between a pound cake and a sponge cake? Is it the same? Maybe I like pound cake better. I don't know. But these, these oceanic plateaus, at least the flood basalt portions of them, are built very quickly. That's the hallmark of a mantle plume uh, creating one of these oceanic plateaus. And so the flood basalt portion of Rangelia was built between 230 and 225 million years ago. And then again, we've got to wait more than 100 million years before the thing gets added to North America. That's the timing of this. And it's out in the Pacific someplace. So Letia, also review, was built, I'm just being nice and simple now, so that's also a 5 million year time window where we're just absolutely belching out all of this mafic magma, this runny mafic magma would create this huge pile of basalt on the ocean floor, an oceanic plateau, Seletia, built between 56 and 51 million years ago. And then right away, we add the thing. So maybe today, yeah, I suppose today, before we quit, we'll look at some key differences between Seletia and Rangeli. And I can't hold it. I'll say one right now. I think I even alluded to this last time. Seletia is still warm. <laughs> And technically, there's a little bit of Silesia that's still erupting as this thing is adding 50 million years ago. But we don't have this crazy lag between building the sponge cake of Rangelia and then adding it. So that's a key difference. Keep track of some other differences, if you would, between the two. Um, I have a map looking down on a Rangelia or Silesia, let's say down through the water. This is a map view, looking down from heaven. And do you know this word? Can you read this word? E-Q-U-A-N-T. I had to look that up. But it was a word suggested to me that I'll, I'll read the email, and I'm not even sure how to pronounce it. I, like it's an equilateral triangle, so equi, equant. Is that what you say? But as far as I know, an equant shape, equant shape, is, is one that kind of has, you know, it's, it's, it's an equal distance from the center all the way around. It's, it's let's just say around. So we got these, these, these sponge cakes that are equant in shape. I'm setting you up for something here in just a second. And here's that same equant oceanic plateau, but from the side. And this is, quote-unquote, normal ocean floor crust that's maybe 5 kilometers, 6 kilometers, 7 kilometers less than 10 kilometers thick on both sides. That's quote-unquote normal ocean floor crust. But then here's this crazy, we're underwater now. This is a cross-section. That's a boat. Here's our sponge cake that not only is an oceanic plow that's elevated. Slow down, boy. 
not only an oceanic plateau that is elevated above the ocean floor, maybe by two, three, four kilometers uh, relief, but seismically also there's a thickened portion of the oceanic plateau beneath, plateau beneath. So we are thickening or even over thickening the crust at these oceanic plateaus. And in the most simple set, wow, I'm extra jazz. So I'm, I'm missing syllables here. I got to calm myself down. Come on, boy. Come on, boy. So calm it down. Calm it down. You didn't have that much coffee this morning. But we have to come up with a mechanism, at least speculate on a mechanism, to create this over-thickened crust in an ocean floor setting. Okay. Where are these things? You expected this, right? We did a little bit of this last time. We're doing more of it today. So I'll hold this steady for you for just a second. Every orange thing is an oceanic plateau. It's a sponge cake. Focus might not be super sharp because I have autofocus turned off, but I hope that you can get the sense. This thing is enormous. I don't know how to pronounce it. Kerguelen? Kerguelen? Massive and apparently still erupting. Apparently, it's still active. The Caribbean sponge cake. Antong Java. Shatsky Rise. Why are these things out here? Why are these equant, generally, oceanic plateaus there? If we look carefully at the continent of Australia, hello, Kathy and others. If we peer down into the waves of the Pacific, everything that's green here is a sponge cake, an oceanic plateau. And you're like, well, those aren't circular. What are you talking about? Again, we're caught in something, and I want to continue to play this out a little bit, setting you up for a discussion that maybe everything's not as simple as this, although it's, it would be nice for our brains to have that. The Caribbean plate, there's an oceanic plateau, apparently, who knew? Underneath much of the Caribbean Sea. I know these colors are all over the place. The Antong Java Plateau, we're back down in the southwestern Pacific now. Okay, you get the idea. And you're like, okay, well that's kind of globetrotting today. Like, do they show up on Marie Tharp's famous bathymetric map of the world? I ordered this online. I forgot I had it. It's really sexy. It's got, I just went to Amazon. It's got this kind of, what is this? It's like burlap. I don't, I don't know what you call this stuff. But I, I, it's, it's, it's pleasing, and it doesn't have a super big glare, I don't think. And you know Marie Tharp, I think, and you know the significance and the historical significance of this, and a woman in geology at a time when there aren't any other women, etc., but as we start looking around the Pacific Ocean floor, do we really see our topic today? Do we see sponge cakes? Like, is this thing a sponge cake? Let me fold. I can even fold this. That's not really a sponge cake, is it? That's the famous Hawaiian Island seamount chain. Those are seamounts. Those are like cupcakes instead of a sponge cake. Hey, oh. I mean, we do have a mantle plume underneath the Big Island of Hawaii, but I don't think we have the scale that we're talking about here. Again, you can kind of start to see how things get a little bit muddled. Now, I think if we flip over to the southern Indian Ocean, so here's Africa and Australia, and that guy, even Marie back in the 40s, notices that this thing is a doozy, and that's that Caraguillian or whatever. Okay, you're like, I'm unsatisfied. Um, you should be, I think, at this point. And ultimately, we're getting to this, remember? 
This is one of my favorite simple diagrams from last time, and I've changed it a little bit. 170, Accrete Cache Creek, 100 million years ago. Accrete Rangelia, 50 million years ago. Accrete Siletia. Well, here we go. This is the western margin of North America. I added Siletia. It wasn't on the diagram last time in my little colored pencils. But you're like, well, those don't look like an oceanic plateau today, do they? And I'm like, no, they don't. But remember the concept of dock and slice. I'm just reminding you that Siletia and Yakutat used to be together as one equant <laughs> sponge cake that then got cut in half. Same for Rangelia. Rangelia here, here, here. Why? Well, it was all together once upon a time, we presume, and it's been sliced. And Cache Creek as well. Okay. I promise I'm leading to something significant. It may not feel like it at the moment. Pausing just for a second. Why do we have this thing generally, if it truly is an oceanic plateau, viewed from above and viewed from the side, almost everybody agrees, if you have something this big and this shape, we need a mantle plume. And so if I go back to that worldwide map, at the first order, I think we want to visualize a mantle plume for most of these. If you're looking for take-home messages, I think that's, that's one thing we can do. But of course, your mind starts racing. Well, why are the mantle plumes there? If there's a mantle plume in every one of these things, why? And then we get into a rabbit hole about why mantle plumes exist. Why do hot spots exist? Does the heat really come down from the boundary between the core and the mantle? Apparently, the geophysicists are liking that more and more. Well, that's a hell of a lot. Sorry, Patrick. That's an crazy, apparently stationary mantle plume heat source coming from the core of the Earth, essentially, all the way up to the surface and creating these huge LIPs, these large igneous provinces. And that reminds me, just quickly before we move on, if we look at the history of studying these large igneous provinces, how was the other board? Nobody knew, you, you can't find the phrase large igneous province back in the 1920s or the 30s or the 40s. Back that far, before World War II, you can hear and read people talking about flood basalts in India, flood basalts in Siberia, flood basalts in the Pacific Northwest of North America. That's the Columbia River basalt. Okay, so that's, that's our German chocolate cake. So there's a German chocolate cake, a continental flood basalt in North America, that's us, in Siberia, that's the uh, um, Siberian traps, uh, India, German chocolate cake, kind of weird to think of a German chocolate cake sitting in India, but that's the Deccan traps. Okay, now we get to the 1970s, and people are just starting to talk about, oh my God, we got these, we got these flood basalts in the ocean floor as well. We didn't really know much about them back then, but now we realize we can start mapping the ocean floors and finding these German chocolate cakes underwater, which we're now calling sponge cakes. And so that really started in the 1970s. So if, if you took a class in college in the 1960s or 70s, first of all, you may or may not be talking about plate tectonics, but I'm almost sure you weren't talking about oceanic plateaus. And if you're starting to get itchy, look at that equant sponge cake right next door, out in the water of the Pacific Northwest 50 million years ago. This is Siletia. So I feel like I want to cut to something big, and it's basically this. Where am I going with all this? This is you talking. Where are you going with all this? You're saying, I saw session A, and you said that everything that I do in this, in this, in this series, 
Everything I do is going to help me understand the North Cascades and the Dream Team. And we're going to be focused on the Eocene 60 to 40 million years ago. Like, wasn't I saying that in session A? Dream Team North Cascades, Eocene. I was. That is the target. So am I off the rails here? What am I doing? Why am I talking about stuff in India and uh, near Australia? And it's not in the Eocene. He pauses for dramatic effect. I got mo both knees replaced five years ago, and when I was recovering, I was emailing a lot just to keep my mind active with a buddy of mine named Andy, and he lives in central Washington, former student here at Central. He's in his 40s, I guess, by now, and he's incredibly well-read, and he's fun to correspond with. He's basically my pen pal on this stuff, and I've always remembered to reread an email, I don't have a date on this, it's probably 2017. And I want to read you Andy's little shorthand, you know, when you write with somebody back and forth, you've got little inside jokes and you've got shorthand and everything. So I'm going to read it kind of word for word. But the purpose for showing this to you, reading this to you from Andy, who's kind of behind the scenes and kind of whispering in my ear, you know, is that I want to show you how oceanic plateaus have anything to do with understanding the geology in the North Cascades in the Pacific Northwest. Here we go. Andy emailing me five years ago. Southern margin of Rangelia is truncated. Insular superterrain is amalgamated Alexander, Rangelia, arc subsequently built on them, other odds and ends. However, Rangelia often used to refer to that which collided 100-ish, since Alexander, part of a smaller, is mostly up in cold, soggy, windswept islands where only the truly determined to go. If it came from north of Scotland, must feel right at home. I don't expect you to read, kind of absorb everything I'm saying. I just want to give you a sense of how he writes to me, but here we go. Major issue with the North Cascades, which I, this is Andy, which I ramble about in email after email. I don't even think I've sent you half of my drafts. Is the North Cascades seem to have suffered from running into not one lip bearing archipelago, but two. First Rangelia and then Silesia. The North Cascades got hit by Rangelia and then got hit by Silesia. The second overprinted the first, sliced and diced, making it look a little bit more complicated than it really is. The terrain story looks actually fairly straightforward. That's the first time I've heard anybody say that. This is the hornet's nest we're talking about in the North Cascades. Here's Andy saying it looks pretty straightforward. If you realize there's been two rounds of trauma, Daddy's excited and screaming into a lappy. We've got some sort of remnant of deep water, chert rich thing sitting on basalt with some ultra mafix. He's in the North Cascades now, Napiqua, maybe Permo Triassic Hosamine, which would work for a native arc. Non native looking stuff goes way back into the Paleozoic, implying large sea slash ocean. There's some proximal stuff. Erosional products, basal Cascade River schist of an eroded Triassic arc, marble mountain plutons and associated volcanic-y looking bits. This, in Mojave-centric worldview, should be shoved over. I'm going to continue, even though you're like, I don't know what you're doing. I hope you see what I'm doing. I'm trying to show you, by reading Andy's guidance, how this is going to help us later this winter when we finally get to the North Cascades in the Eocene. Our current landscape here in the Northwest and that of Southeast Alaska is massively influenced by at least two other lips, the Karmutsan Nikolai, part of the Rangelia, and Seletsia Yakutat, also the Carmax Volcanics, which has been proposed to share a Hawaiian hotspot tie with the first two, what, has a role in the story. Until maybe the 1990s, lips were a somewhat overlooked and underestimated factor contributing to growth of crust over time. And again, Andy 
writes these drafts, and sometimes he sends me another draft of the same email. I'm going to read another draft. You're like, what? This has different take on it. Same concept, but different details. And I'll leave this alone, but you keep in the back of your mind that I'm guided by one email from five years ago from Andy, former student at CWU. Unless I'm talked out of it by other people. The reason, this is Andy, another draft of the same thing. The reason the North Cascades are especially nasty and horrible to figure out, okay, now it's nasty and horrible. I thought it was pretty straightforward than last draft, is that it seems to be the result of not one, but at least two collisions or slow motion train wrecks involving oceanic plateaus at slightly different angles. First, the 100-ish one involved Rangelia that crunched Jurassic and early Cretaceous basins, plus or minus arc. And then the 50-ish one that did the same for the early Eocene basins and arc and previously crunched basins and arcs before it. The poor Skagit Nice, that's Stacia Gordon country, looks to be a basin that got crunched twice. This created a fold and fault interference pattern that I, for one, don't quite grasp, although at least I'm aware of it. And a lot of the rocks in the Metau, such as Winthrop Sandstone and Pipestone Canyon, look a lot like our Swak and Chumstick because they formed under similar circumstances. Just 50-odd million years and some multiplier of a thousand kilometers apart. I don't do all this by myself. I'm the guy talking into your TV or whatever, but I've got this kind of inner circle, these little whisperers who help me. And there's geologists of different ages, and a few of them keep watching and keep sending feedback, and that guides what we're doing here, in addition to your comments for sure. But I wanted to share that to you, first of all, to just to help you see why we are here, okay? Okay. Act two. I don't have the chalkboard. What did it say? Chocolate sponge cake versus chocolate gummy worms? I think it's worth contemplating how we recreate piles of basalt that are now here in the Pacific Northwest that have been accreted and try to speculate what they truly looked like when they were out in the ocean floor. Can we truly say they were all sponge cake circular like this? Or if you want something like a chocolate gummy worm on a map out in the ocean, instead of this, what implications might we have? I'm going to cut to it before I read another passage of another email. And you're like, I hate the email part. Why does he read those to you? I like it. I think it's effective. And they're tailor-made comments to us. Andy's was five years ago, but the next one's going to come from Mitch. Remember Mitch Mahalanek that I mentioned last session? I said I got an email into him asking him about Cache Creek. Well, I don't think he watched Session B. I think he emailed me while Session B was happening, to be honest. But when I was done with you on, on uh, Wednesday afternoon, I read Mitch's email. I'm like, whoa. So Mitch is more of a worm guy than a cake guy, and I'll have to explain what I mean by that. But, but, There are reconstructions, 180 million years ago, for instance, where you're reconstructing Rangelia. I don't think this is Mitch, but this is kind of a group of Joanne Nelson and Maurice Colpron and Mitch Mahalanek and a few other BC and Yukon geologists. And they're kind of drawing these gummy worms out there instead of a cake. Worms instead of circular cakes. And you're like, who cares? What are you doing? I hope you'll see in a second. Is an oceanic plateau truly like this? 
Or why are there a bunch of cupcakes out there instead of a true oceanic plateau or something else? So here's another map of the same sort of thing. These oceanic plateaus are these large guys, these large spun cakes underwater. But I think we have a whole shade of ranges here. Like in the same Pacific Ocean, don't we have the classic mantle plumes or hot spots in red and then a moving plate over the top of them? So we have a whole line of waterlogged cupcakes, seamount chains in other words? We do. I mean, that's what Marie's showing us, right? Those are mostly cupcakes strung out in a line. Those aren't oceanic plateaus. Are they apples and oranges or just different kinds of apples? What? Okay, I, th I think you got my point. So, another email. Kind of getting us into this area of cakes versus worms. Oh, we don't need it. You can know. And before I, before I read portions of Mitch's email, let me uh, let the cat out of the bag. In my simple mind, here's what we're thinking. Oh, we've got a circular cake, a circular sponge cake out there. Uh, I think mantle plume for my simple brain. But if we have maps like we just looked at with gummy worms instead of mantle plumes, I don't think this means mantle plume, do you? What options do we have with plate tectonics to explain basalt underwater that's eventually going to get added to North America, let's say. But if it looks like a gummy worm, a chocolate gummy worm out in the ocean, what are our options? Well, one option is we've got some sort of divergent plate boundary. We've got some sort of rift. Like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, like the East Pacific Rise. Is it possible when you draw a gummy worm out in the ocean, oh, I'm folding like a madman now, the burlap map. That's the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. That's a lot of basalt. That's a gummy worm. East Pacific Rise. That's a gummy worm. What's another possibility? Is it possible a gummy worm where we create a bunch of basalt out in the ocean is not a divergent plate boundary, but a convergent plate boundary? And you're like, oh, I don't know, really? Well, how about the outer Aleutian Islands? Where the oceanic Pacific plate is subducting beneath oceanic North American plate, and we have a trench, and we have subduction, and we have an oceanic island arc. Tholeitic. Oceanic island arc, a line of volcanoes that are made out of basalt. So you maybe were ready for just a simple mantle plume meeting, and maybe I was too until a couple days ago. And then I start thinking about this and reading this email over and over again from Mitch. And I start realizing we have options, and that option continues when people are discussing things. Okay, I'm going back to, oh, here, okay. So, Mitch Mahalanek sent Wednesday afternoon. Hi, Nick, great to hear from you and to learn that you're still active as a geoscience ambassador, engaging the public and exposing how embarrassingly little we know with certainty about the paleogeography of North America. You have a knack for asking seemingly simple questions that expose widespread assumptions that underpin the status quo story. Thank you. Me. I'm doing a show on oceanic plateaus on Saturday. I have plenty on Rangelia and Silesia, but I have very little on Cache Creek. 
If you remember, in Social Session B, I kept saying, are we even sure there's an oceanic plateau? I keep reading that, but I, is there an oceanic plateau, a sponge cake in the nucleus of Cache Creek that got added 170 million years ago? Here's Mitch's reply. Who's Mr. Cache Creek, by the way? He's got paper after paper on Cache Creek terrain and all those terrains way up north. Up north there. Mitch. Well, it's probably a good thing that you have very little on Cache Creek because there is very little plateau material in the Cache Creek terrain. Not so long ago, it was believed that the Cache Creek terrain was mostly a relic plateau. The death blow for that idea was an outgrowth of a project that we ran two decades ago in the best exposed part of this Cache Creek that spans the BC-Yukon border. So Mitch and a student were up in the Grello here at the boundary between BC and UK, uh, uh, YK, between British Columbia and Yukon territories. It was mainly through the work of a former PhD grad student, Joe English. <laughs> um, we basically found that there's tholeitic volcanic arc, or in other words, island arc tholeites, primitive oceanic, intra-oceanic arc, instead of mantle plume oceanic plateau. There are relics of plateau that tend to form the substrate of some reefs and massive carbonate banks in the Cache Creek, but they're comparatively rare. So you know what I want to do for our class? Now that we know that there's options here, and Mitch is kind of over in this neck of the woods, not this neck of the woods, uh, I think I'm done. I think we're down to two main events. Now you can argue back, and maybe we will, that Mitch is kind of hardcore on saying it's not an oceanic plateau story with the Cache Creek. But I don't know if why we'd argue push back on that. First of all, he's the expert, one of the main experts. But two, it's too old for our story anyway in the North Cascades. So again, thank you for all the thoughts about the three main events and all the cute ideas, but I think officially we're down to two, and I kind of knew that anyway. I kind of knew we were just doing these two main guys according to Andy's email. Mitch has got five pages worth, by the way. I'll just give it a little bit more. Plateaus... Plateaus such as Antong Java or Kerguelen, the largest plateaus on Earth, are tens of thousands of square kilometers in extent and are long-lived. For example, Antong Java Plateau formed during at least two separate magmatic pulses, 121 million years ago and 90 million years ago, separated by a 30 million year magmatic hiatus. But actually, I read a paper recently that questions this long range in the OJP. The Kerguelen formed semi-continuously since 119 million years ago with present-day volcanic activity in the central plateau region. Plateaus such as these could provide a stable, long-lasting substrate for thick regional limestone deposition over Oka. Okay. Seletzia is essentially 100% German chocolate cake in the water. It's a pure chocolate sponge cake, more or less. I think this Rangelia sponge cake, which was mostly built between 230 and 225, I think there's a lot of stuff in there as well. I think Rangelia has many other kinds of rocks, older and younger, and even within. So there is a more complicated history for Rangelia. But if we're talking about Seletzia, and we certainly will for a long, long time this winter, Seletzia is a more straightforward, I think everybody would agree, a much more straightforward history and therefore stratigraphy of building the damn thing. Uh, Mitch has got one more for us. One more passage. I got a question for you. Mitch Mahalanek. 
asking me a question, asking us a question. Hey, Nick, most workers agree that Rangelia and Alexander terrains were together, at least in part, by 310 million years ago, possibly by 360 million years ago. The oldest known rocks in Alexander are late Proterozoic, Cambrian Wales, Metamorphic Suite, the top of Devonian Mississippian Ark was built. Sicker in Rangelia that I live on. Oh, he lives on, Rangel uh, uh, on uh, Vancouver Island. Followed by Coast Spatial, Pennsylvanian, and Early Permian Arc. And then that arc happened to be a substrate for a linear oceanic plateau. Linear oceanic plateau. He wants a gummy worm that's an oceanic plateau. Does Mitch. What's his question? Do you guys see the Rangelia flood basalts as a product of deep-seated mantle plume? Or are they a product of of arc rifting or something else. Basically, are these co-spatial extants coincidental or biased by preservation? Lots of big words there. But that's what got me into this area, prompted by Mitch's question. I got one more thing, and then we're going to get to the third act. That sounds weird, but you'll see what I mean. Merle Beck has a blog. If you Google Merle Beck, and we'll be talking quite a bit about Merle Beck this winter. You might have seen an interview that I did with him at his house a couple years ago, or last year, I kind of forget. But if you put in frivolities, Merle has all these really fun to read, single page little blog posts. He's a fun writer to read. And he's Pushing 90, maybe he is 90 years old. He's in a retirement community now up in the Bellingham area. But he watches these. Merle might be with us live. I think he was last time. In fact, I know he was because he sent me an email uh, right after session B. But before we get to that quick email, here's Merle when talking about, you remember the dock and slice? I'm done talking about the formation of these sponge cakes now. We're now just quickly transitioning to docking and slicing. This is from last summer, called Smeared Out Terrains. Merle, I've been taking advantage of our sunny weather by half dozing on my back deck while listening to various Nick Zentner geology podcasts. Those are the audio episodes I've been doing. Much of the material is new to me, either ideas or have originated since I stopped working in the Cordillera, or sadly, stuff I may have known a long time ago but have thoroughly forgotten. Either way, uh, it's been useful, restful, and fun. But I have a suggestion. So Merle spent a whole career in paleomagnetism at Western Washington University and was instrumental in this thing called Baja BC that came up last time and will come up again uh, this winter. My question is basically, are we paying too little attention to what I call post-docking attenuation? After all, interaction with various oceanic plateaus with western North America has had a northward element since way back in the Mesozoic. I can visualize roughly equant, <laughs> that's why I have the word, equant exotic terrains getting all smeared out by dextral faulting after they're added to North America. Seems likely to me. What do you think? That's his blog post from six months ago, four months ago. And here's Merle's email, hot off the presses after session B. Nick, I just finished watching your Eocene B lecture and feel compelled to chip in my own two bits worth. It seems to be likely that pre-accretion terrains probably tended to be more or less equant in map view, whereas we see them now mostly resembling string beans. Mappy McMap. Fundamentally then, there must have been a slice and dice process at work and the right oblique nature of North America interaction with oceanic plates provides a convenient mechanism. But I got to tell you, Nick, I'm beginning to wonder just how much of the northward relative displacement used as a basis for Baja BC took place pre-docking 
we always visualize the process as a displacement of pieces of bona fide North America. At least I certainly did. Could part of it have occurred out there in the ocean? Oh, to be 60 again and back in the game. Keep up the good work, Nick. I blanch at explaining these concepts to non-geologists. I've tried many times, and it's damn hard. Thank you, Merle. We'll keep revisiting that, but Merle's wondering about the dock and slice. Do we, are we doing some slicing before we dock the thing? Do we dock and slice an oceanic plateau? Or do we make an oceanic plateau that's equant, slice it somehow out in the ocean, dock the two halves, and then slice them again? One of the masters rethinking something or having a new thought because of being with us. Okay, this is a big moment. First of all, we're 10 minutes to the top of the hour, and we're moving to Act 3. What's Act 3? Vancouver Island. Can you guess why this is a big moment? Can you guess what we're going to try to do for the first time with this live streaming series? I live here, and somebody lives in Nanaimo, British Columbia, which is on Vancouver Island. And Vancouver Island is worth Act 3 because we not only have our sponge cake that added 100 million years ago somewhere, but also the very southern tip of Vancouver Island has another sponge cake that added 50 million years later. And remember what Andy said in his email, the docking of these two oceanic plateaus is the main story for why the North Cascades hornet's nest is so hornet's nesty. So do we know anybody on Vancouver Island that lives in Nanaimo that can help us live? Yeah, we do. I don't know if you saw any videos that I did this summer and this fall, but I tagged along with this guy's glacial geology field trip. He's mostly a glacial geology professor at Vancouver Island University, but he's a well-rounded geologist, and he's also been, like Andy, in my ear, whispering for a couple of years by email. And he does a lot of teaching, so he's uh, not only sharing scientific papers, but he's also sharing teaching ideas. He's in the green room right now. Let's see if this works. Okay, I got to talk to myself now, Jerome. This is a big moment. I'm going to first of all, oh, I had echo cancellation on the whole time. I forgot to uncancel it. So here we go. Without further ado. Woo-hoo! Uh, can we uh, hear you speak, young man? Okay, we'll see if this works. Do you hear me? I can. Excellent. Let me pa let me pause. This is really exciting. Uh, we tested this yesterday, uh, and uh, let me just check the live chat. Are you set up now to see the live chat, Jerome, or not? Yeah, I see it too. So I see okay. the questions. And so five by five, they can hear you. Wonderful. Okay, and we got about a thousand watching you. So um, I don't want to cut into any more of your time, except to say. You must take your students regularly to some outcrop of Rangelia. How close to your campus are you to some outcrop of this Rangelia basalt? I can I can probably throw a rock from my office and hit Rangelia. In place? Bedrock, really? 
pretty close. Yeah. I mean, there's some till on top, which is, you know, always nice to look at, but beyond that, uh, yeah, it's right by the highway above campus. It's all over the place. So you are sort of a, my campus is on a bit of a hill. And so there's a critical elevation where you hit the Nanaimo group sedimentary rocks, but then anything above is mostly Carmuts and basalt uh, for us specifically, okay. and then definitely Rangelia. Well, let's do that part. Let's start with that. So I hinted that Celestia was this um, sponge cake that was almost 100% basalt. And there's local names like crescent basalt and other things. But you've got the Carmuts and basalt, and that's the substantial part of Rangelia where you are. Is that the local name? Yeah, it is for the basalt. That's the name. Um, I think and what know, else? People what, might, sorry. I'm going to make you, uh, I'm, I'm going to keep double, I'm going to draw a little bit while you talk, I think. But can you tell sure. us what, so I indicated or hinted that ra the, the Rangelia terrain is more than just the Karmuts and basalt then. So within, above, and below, can you give us a sense of the other rocks that are part of this uh, story? Sure. So I'll just tell you first and then I'll show you because I got a whole bunch of samples in the classroom where I'm at. Oh, wow. Can, Good. You can put some visuals to it. Good. Oh, some people are saying they can't hear me. Hold on. All right. Not hearing Jerome. Uh, so you've got two choices here. Yes or no. Can you hear Jerome right now? Yes or no. Those are the, the only two choices you have to type into the live chat. I'll just talk and ramble this so people know. Yes and no. Yes and no. Me. Those are your two. Mostly yes. Okay, you're going. Yeah. Okay. You're on. Good to go. All right. So I think one of the key things to just put in place first is that uh, those oceanic plateaus, uh, they're really tough to study because they're so inaccessible, right? They're underwater. The, if you want to get some samples, you have to drill into them. And even if you can get there to drill them, there's a limit to how deep you can drill them. Um, and so getting an idea of the full stratigraphy of a plateau is really tricky because they're you know significantly thicker than the surrounding material yeah when you have a docked plateau or when you have one that ends up being on land like what you have on vancouver island partly this is sort of this unique opportunity to in some cases see a really big portion a proportion of the stratigraphy or the, the layers of your cake basically exposed and accessible to a point that you'd never be able to do if you were studying them in place right so in that sense you know what you have on uh, Vancouver Island or through Angelia is really kind of unique and there's not that many places where you get that full view both in terms of the thickness but also the extent of it. Does that make sense? Yep. Keep going baby. So so what we have on, uh, on uh, Vancouver Island which makes up part of Rangelia and we know that Rangelia also extends a bit uh, north and there are other formations like the Alexander. Um, Rangelia contains really well a series of different rock suites but relative to or relevant to what you're talking about um there's pretty good evidence and mitch was talking about it in his email that it builds onto or on top of an arc and that arc itself had previously sort of built on or through uh basically precambrian material okay so okay. there's sort of multiple generations of all this yes the, the arc itself, so the, the basal arc, think of it as the substrate for what will become the Carmutsen basalt is Devonian in age. So we're going back, you know, 360, 370 million years. Okay. Good. And then what we, after that, we know that there's, we can observe that there's the uh, flood basalts and the extensive, you know, thickness of basalts that make up the Carmutsen formation on Vancouver Island. There's a somewhat correlative, well, there's a correlative, but somewhat different unit of basalts further north called the Nikolai. Uh, when I say further north, it's into Alaska. So that's the half but, that, that got sent to Alaska. So we had the, the, the entire flood basalt presumably together and then the half, the, so we, we docked and then sliced. So the, the slice, that's, the, the half that's up there is Nikolai, the half that's down here is Karmutsen. Right. And whether or not that's sliced or not, I think that's kind of the crux of Mitch's question. You know, are uh -huh. you wrapping this in a linear fashion or have you sliced it up into slivers? So how, forget about Mitch's comment for a second. How have you taught, uh, do you, so you have rocks below the, your Rangelia flood basalts that are arc-like. Uh, have you taught a oceanic island arc system that then somehow 
uh, runs into a mantle plume or like how, how do you, those seems like two different stories to me. Yeah, Our, I'm just going to move. I'm going to, I'm going to show you the, I'm going to show you the rocks and then I'll, ooh. Uh, I'll talk around it. Good. Let me just switch my settings here for a quick second. Uh, looks like this is still working for everybody. Hey. All righty. Oh my so, God. I'm going to, we have it laid out. So, I mean, I'll just give you the tour. So we have it laid out all around the, t the class. Okay. That's the whole suite of Vancouver Island rock. So it's not just the Devonian arc plus Garmutsen. It's the whole package of what we find on the island. Here's the map that sort of frames this. So if you need a picture of what, how much rocks we're talking about, everything green on this map um, is related to the episode you're talking about. So Good. there are different shades of green, so it's tricky to see. But the bulk of the green is this Garmutsen formation. So you're wondering how much there is. Uh, there's a lot. <laughs> uh, there's a huge amount of green and the pink that you see through it are plutons that come later so they obviously overprint those but so there's presumably the green was more extensive pre-plutons as well so there's how a lot are, of it how old are the plutons oh it varies okay okay <laughs> let's, multiple let's not go generations around. of them <laughs> okay okay um so here's let's start at the arc let's yeah start, what i was going to point him so we do right. in this arc we have basalts we find lots of basalts in parts of that arc. Um, there's a lot of sedimentary rocks that are that make up. If you have to, you know, imagine this arc, you would have had fringing um, reefs around it. So we do find limestone in places. We find lots of cherts. For those of the listeners that are in my neighborhood or that have visited, uh, this is what we call the sicker group. Yep. And the sick, the sicker group, sort of the type locality of sicker group is around an area called the Cowichan Valley. It's sort of mid Vancouver Island area. So that's a, a well studied area. So we can, it contains volcanic rocks, volcanic clastic rocks. Uh, there's some of the limestone that we find within. There's some examples of the limestone, lots and lots of rocks, uh, brecciated rocks. You can see some of the breccias that are oh, wow. uh, produced as a result of that. Um, what else? There's some uh, mixtures of volcanic clastic rocks as well so being an arc there's a fair amount of variability but there's also a pretty significant um component that's sedimentary that uh, of, of the systems around the arc let, let me hold you up for just it's a secret. second yeah so, so, when, so when you say arc for everybody you're visualizing like the aleutian islands like a true line of of, of islands uh yeah i think that's the implication in this case exactly okay, good. okay thank you Sicker group, which I was just showing you, also has a, a slightly younger correlative unit. Again, substrate for what will become the Karmutsen basalt. That's called the Buttle Lake group. But we're just sort of splitting hairs in the stratigraphy here. But um, sure. the, the key thing is that it's the substrate. Okay. Then we move into what characterizes Karmutsen. Here we go. Here we go. And so Karmutsen is um, on Vancouver Island. It's roughly about six kilometers thick. It is the, the basalts that make up the bulk of Karmutsen. and they're, um, they're a little thinner, I think about a kilometer and a half, because in places three kilometers for the Nikolai Formation yep. up north in Alaska. Uh -huh. But on Vancouver Island for uh, Karmutsen, it's about six kilometers. So it's a substantial thickness of, of basalt. And so there's evidence, the bulk of it being uh, submarine flows. So we find, you know, how do we know there's submarine? Well, most of the time we find that there's pillows. And so there's, you know, really, really good examples of pillow basalts here. I got one on the desk here. So you can see a nice small pillows, but you can see three pieces of a pillow. So there's one pillow rim, there's another, and there's a top one here. And in between, we've got this inter pillow area, which um, often is, it contains, port, you know, the spalled outer rims of the pillows as they're being formed, they're expanding, they're cracking, and those little pieces of the outer rim of the pillow break up and end up in the uh, in the interpillow zone. Between them, they get, um, I guess, cemented or they, they sort of uh, it's in, surrounded by a combination often of quartz and calcites and other minerals. But it produces a rock in this region that people really like to look for. It's called dallasite. So there's more examples. You can see little linear pieces. These are all your small pillow wow. Uh, wow. rims that end up in there. Okay. So those types of rocks are very, very diagnostic at Karmutsen for that particular uh, package. The stratigraphy of Karmutsen uh, has been described as sort of a stratigraphy that records progressive emergence of the plateau. So it gets yeah. shallower with time. 
Yeah. And so there's a point where uh, the plateau becomes very close to the water surface and in fact spends some time in a subaerial situation. In other words, it's sort of poked above the water surface. Yes. And so as you shallow, as the plateau shallows, we start seeing development of uh, limestone in those shallow zones. And so there are formations so that if you think of your sponge cake, and you've often talked about your German chocolate cake, so the sponge cake of Karmutsen contains, you know, layers of other material, like icing in between your layers of, because the limestone, in some cases for uh, at the base, is thicker, you have to picture the same sort of scenario where you have shallower waters in places, and then when you can develop your limestone, then you've got um, th these interbeds of sedimentary rocks mm. that make their way within the stratigraphy. And that becomes a clue and a di diagnostic clue of the emergence of that whole plateau. Um, so examples of this, there's a formation called the Quatsino Formation. So there's a nice piece of limestone from Quatsino. And then... Um, Is that within the Karmutsen or on top? It's, that's an interesting question. Um, it's certainly within the stratigraphy in a sense that um, it's obviously, it's covered by more basalt in places. Yeah. But uh, at some point it's on top, right? I mean, these are developing at a moment when the, the younger basalts have probably not fully erupted or at least not completely covered mm. them. So it's, a, it's both to your answer. <laughs> yeah, okay. As your okay. answer to, it's a bit of both. Um, and then ultimately the, the plateau, the, the uh, flood basalts that make up most of Karmutsen, uh, there's submergence of this plateau, there's sinking and there's subsidence of the, of the plateau. And so people have uh, inferred that really the, the main phase of subsidence is really related to the movement and the waning of the mantle plume. So now we're getting right into the interpretations of how you actually generate that large volume of basalt that makes up Karmutsen. This is great. Um, anything else you wanted to show us before I go back to talking to you directly? Well, I was thinking um, about the question that Mitch posed to you about Good. whether this is sort of a, a formerly equant, you know, plateau that gets sliced up, or does it start off being linear like a worm, as you were describing it? Yeah. Um, and it's a tricky question to answer because if you look at the modern analogs of plateaus, you have some that do seem to be equant, and others that, like right. the Kerguelen example, Kerguelen does not seem to be particularly equant though Kregelin seems to be erupting so long that perhaps it is like two, three, four equant, you know, pieces that now look kind of linear. So you're kind of in a, in a tough situation to uh, assess this. But I was thinking about the question, and if you look on the map, um, there are blue streaks you might see near the top and yeah. a bit lower. And some yeah. of those, the light blue streaks you see up top, that's the Quetzino limestone. That's the limestone that we have as part of the stratigraphy yeah. Um, of, of Karmutsen. It changes name. It's also called Parsons Bay and other places they're okay. related, but uh, they're linear. It's interesting to see that they're linear. So if you think of the limestone depositing or being deposited on the fringes and the shallow areas of this huge volume of basalt, why are they so linear? Is that linearity a reflection of the geometry of the, the plateau itself? In other words, yeah. it was linear when this was happening. So does yeah. the slicing happen before? Now we're back to Merle's questions, perhaps, right. or is it in fact formed in this linear worm-like fashion and then the, the limestone is fringing something that's already linear? Um, one of the tests might be, well, if it's sliced after and the linearity is a, is a product of slicing, are those limestones deformed or not, or are they still in place? And the answer to that is in places we do see it um, deformed but in other places, it's completely undisturbed and still has its original, almost original horizontal uh, stratigraphy or pattern. So I'm not sure if it answers it, but I was thinking as the question came up, that might be a way that you would test it is to say, well, what does the limestone pattern tell you about the geometry of the plateau at the time when it's being deposited? This is excellent. And of course, my I think I can hear some of our viewers asking, uh, What's the difference? Who cares? The thing's circular, the thing's a gummy worm. Like, what? why is it even an important question? And I think we should keep that in the back of our mind because if I'm talking about significant trauma inland 
all the way to the Rockies, let's say, from something that we're doing here at the coast, we do need to know if we have a gummy worm or if we have a, a sponge cake. Um, and, you know, if, if there's still lots of discussion between the two uh, the, of these groups, we're not going to solve it here. But I think it's an important question to reconstruct the best we can. So once yeah. we, oh, look at you, you're all over the, there we go. Thank you. Um, okay. I so think it's caught up. I we're think good. it is. Uh, that was great. I think we're going to go right to some live Q&A, and then that will give us a chance. If you wanted to comment further on any of these things, these guys will prompt you a little bit or steer you a little bit. So I hope you guys are still wanting okay. to hang out with us. So just to check, Jerome, so you can see uh, the questions as well, or should I be asking you their questions? No, I can see them. I just okay. missed all the questions that might have rolled by as I was talking. Oh, sure. So oh, sure. That, that's right. So I will. Uh, so this is a chance to ask some questions to Jerome. If he gets a chance, of, you're going to, of course, hit your caps lock and do uppercase. And uh, if Jerome is having a hard time seeing certain questions, then I will, uh, I'll jump in and, uh, and take over. But uh, and there's always a little bit of a delay, as you know, but. Yeah, your lighting's looking great. We we tried this yesterday, and Jerome was super fuzzy and out of sync and everything else. So he's using his cell coverage. What are you, Verizon? What what are you, Jerome? Let's put in a plug. Uh, it's uh, over here. It's called Rogers. Rogers. <laughs> this episode yeah. of Jerome from the Classroom brought to you by Rogers. Oh, you don't Technology. need to advertise for him, please. You really don't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, hey. So I'll start. Scott wonders, hey, Jerome, what's the, yeah. what's the, what's the interface between Celestia and Rangelia like? Like where they come okay. in contact with each um, other. So, yes. Yeah, so there is, in fact, a little terrain that is jammed or a portion uh, called the Pacific Rim terrain. It's a bit of an interesting mixture. I'm not sure if it's entirely super clear what it represents. But what we do know, like really with the, the Celestia, Crescent. Here we call it Crescent, but it's Celestia. Okay. The same, same pair. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a zone of pretty heavy deformation. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, folded rocks and highly uh, deformed rocks that are in that zone. Okay. And you see that really well uh, in the city of Victoria and outside of Victoria. If you go west of Victoria and a little bit north, uh, you see that quite well. That that whole deformation zone. I think you've got enough to do just concentrating. Unless you want to read your own questions, maybe I can just moderate here. Um, I'm I'm missing half of them because they just go okay. by like a machine Good. gun. Let me, yeah, they do. Let let me uh, let me take over here. Uh, appreciate everybody asking questions. Oh, I don't know if we should. Well, why not? John Ogden says, uh, "What would rule out a westward subduction island arc source?" So Jerome watched all these exotic terrain series last winter, and we were talking about a westward subduction island arc as opposed to an eastward. I don't know if we can handle that right now. Do you want to try something quick? Well, I mean, first question is which arc? Are we talking about yeah. the, the Sicker arc? Yeah. The Devonian one, or are we talking something more recent? Because there's a succession of arcs, potentially, so it's hard to unpack them unless you can tell me the name that you're thinking of the age. Okay. Uh, Sid wants to know, what's the age of the limestone or the limestones, plural, on Vancouver Island? Well, they're within the, they're within the uh, upper part of the Rangelia package. So we're in, you know, they're going to be younger than this 225 or very close to the, uh, the 225 age because they're, okay. they're in the sandwich of Rangelia uh, and Kermutsen, pardon me. And Richard comments, non-deformed limestone screams island arc, doesn't it? Um. Potentially, though, I don't think they're specifically diagnostic to an island arc because you could certainly, you know, the deformation might not. So the, the, the key thing is, is the deformation contemporaneous with the arc activity, or in this case, for us, is the de deformation potentially contemporaneous with slicing or not? So I don't yeah. think in that sense that the deformation, we can make predictions for different environments, but um, yeah. I'm not sure if in this case it's clearly diagnostic. Okay, Patty brings up something that I always get caught in. Maybe you do too. Um, when I draw a little cartoon of your island and I don't color Rangelia inland as well, everybody thinks this is a terrain coming in. It's like, oh, there's one still coming in. They can see the island. 
And so Patty uh, asks, um, where did you go, Patty? Is Vancouver Island going to accrete to BC, assuming it hasn't accreted yet? How do you handle that? I think it's already accreted. <laughs> yes, it is. I think the thinking is that it's, the accretion is, I mean, it's thought to have occurred by 100 million years ago. It's one of your big anchoring dates in your three acts, now two acts. So you're not alone, Patty. You can see this island and the, you, you kind of, it looks like it's coming in, but it's, it's common bedrock all through here. This is just some, I don't know how shallow the water is or how deep the water is, but we're visualizing it as just a, a, a little puddle, basically, on this continuous exotic terrain, both from Vancouver's home and you look across the way to, to Vancouver itself. That's still Rangeli over there, is it not? So, um, yes, but it's not sort of clear or that clear. And ah. Somebody else asked a question about why the coasts look a bit different west and east. Um, part of the issue is that the east, so what is the west coast of the mainland or the east coast, the far east coast of Vancouver Island, however far you want to extend it. There's the Georgia Strait in between, which becomes the Puget Sound for those that might need that to visualize what I'm talking about, the, the, the area of water between Vancouver Island and the mainland. Um, there are plutons that have been intruding through that area as long as the coast has been active. I mean, this is go back to your other series. There are plutons that have traveled here and then there are plutons that have been intruding through all of these plutons. And so that intrusive uh, contact or boundary uh, has a chance or a potential for obscuring big parts of what could be Rangelia. And so some people have mapped rocks that do have affinities with what we see in terms of the Carmutsen basalt and other units that are in Rangelia. Uh, they're not very extensive, and it also happens to be an area that is fairly inaccessible. These are very high uh, mountains. There's not a lot of roads. There's not a lot of access. And so all these factors probably combine to leave that as a bit of an open question in terms of how far eastward of Vancouver Island does Rangelia extend? Mm. Because if we've accreted it and we're done accreting, um, how far are the pieces of it? How far do they go eastward? Which is a great question. We'll do a few more and then um, we'll, we'll say goodbye to you. Uh, Island Girl says, is there any chert in the Karmutsen? P.S. Thanks for coming. Uh, there, oh, that's a good question. I don't think there is major chert in the Karmutsen, uh, but there is a lot of chert in the Sicker group. So this is this underlying uh, substrate for the Karmutsen basalt. And that chert, even though it's extremely old and is, uh, stratigraphically at the base of a six kilometer pile of mostly basalts is exposed in a lot of places, especially around the, this Mount Sicker area. So a lot of people find chert because it's derived from those, those basal units. Um, I think we'll finish with this one. A lot of people asking about a uh, potential Galapagos hotspot or where do you visualize yeah. Rangelia originally? And I think we're saving that. I, I think I think our first show after the Thanksgiving break will be something to do with trying to visualize where Rangelia is, whether it's a gummy worm or a, a, a sponge cake. Is it down at the equator? What's the timing of that? Where was North America at that time? And I guess a little bit as to, you know, did Rangelia really accrete at Jerome's house? or did Rangelia Crete much further south? And that's a huge discussion, but maybe how do you teach? Well, two things. How many field trips are you running to different exposures of Rangelia? And can you give us a sense of how far you're driving and how often you're going to those outcrops? Oh, sure. Uh, let's do that first. Um, okay, so uh, I can, we frequently encounter it on many field trips for all kinds of reasons. Um, I mean, I don't have to drive far. I can walk to an outcrop of Karmutsen basalt in five minutes or less if I want to. <laughs> um, and then last time we did the first series, there's a couple of video clips. I filmed one at a place called Neck yes. Point. And yes. that's a place where there's beautiful examples of pillow basalts. Uh, and that's, you know, 15 minute drive from here if we want to go. Um, I also filmed another little clip in another place in uh, Nanus Bay, where in this case there was no Karmutsen, but is an area where there was a major unconformity between the base of the Nanaimo group and Sicker. So there was this, these sediments that were, you know, close to 300 million years separated in, in time by that much, over that unconformity. Uh, but you don't have to go very far to encounter Karmutsen basalt. Yeah, yeah. In this area. And then the last question. 
if you teach so let me just go ahead. oh sorry yeah. Yeah. yeah no 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 no. go ahead and i'll, I'll just wrap it up after with the, the other um so in your teaching whether it's 101 or a more advanced class with your geology majors you must get into the origin of rangelia and not yeah. just the shape like we're talking about today but reconstructing where that thing was originally and where it docked how, how do you do yeah. that in, in, in five minutes or less with us right now without giving everything away? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's tricky. And so we tend to, we tend to do it uh, to different degrees of detail at different levels. You know, I have a colleague who will teach probably around the geochemistry of some of the various types of basalts we find in, in Karmutsen itself, but also elsewhere in some of the other basalts we have on the island, try to differentiate them based on those properties. Yes. Uh, which is a, a very complex other set of of questions. But if you're starting in first year, I mean, you're, you're able to make some pretty diagnostic observations and rarely do you get to, rarely you have a smoking gun in this field in terms of a, you know, a linkage between uh, a form or a process, a, a form and its process, but the pillow basalt of, uh, of Karmutsen are really diagnostic of these submarine eruptions. So this is an, an, e an easy way to get people to kind of quickly connect really important uh, pieces and then realize the subsequent question, which is, so how do we do this? And why do we have basically, you know, ocean floor material above land, you know, very, <laughs> very high, very tall here on the landscape. How do we get that exposed? We should expect to see this, you know, how do you get basically a seafloor landscape up on land? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so when that automatically puts you into all these complex tectonic questions, uh, and then, as you said, you open this bit of a can of worms and, and, and then the, the work and the effort is really in trying to keep it manageable because it's yes. just so, <laughs> yeah. yes. such a big question. Yes. Yes. Um, well, this has been so a real, I just want to make one thrill. last, just Please. To tell you one last thing. Uh, not that I want to, the, the Galapagos question is a really interesting one. And I know you want to do it. You're going to do a show on this. So uh, I guess so. Maybe yeah. One way, to one way to close off on that one is and you and I have chatted about this when we were practicing the, the tech here, is that when you're thinking about ocean plateaus, you realize that there are actually multiple criteria that go into the identification of a plateau. Sometimes it's based on thickness, sometimes it's based on extent, it's based on chemistry, and it's, a, it's sort of this amalgamation of uh, factors that allow you to get to this interpretation of whether it's an oceanic plateau or not. Um, the interesting thing is if you link plateaus to plumes, then there's like a sequence or a series of predictions you can make. You know, you have a huge outpouring initially when you have the, the plume head. And uh, if the plates are presumably moving over the plume head, then after this initial outpouring, you might have a trail of small little islands. And so these all become testable questions or testable hypotheses that you would expect to, see, to be able to um, try to connect. And so far, that has not been really done. Rangelia is assumed to be, and I think it's reasonable based again on the thickness and then the characteristics of the material uh, associated with a big mantle plume. It would be this initial outpouring of a mantle plume, but after your mantle plume wanes, where's the trail? Where's the Hawaiian trail, for example, or equivalent to the Hawaiian trails of islands? Um, because if you could pinpoint those, then you've got an idea of where it starts. It's like the breadcrumbs leading yeah. back to the, to the source. And I'll just stop there. How about that? <laughs> well, a hint in that Galapagos paper is the guy's talking about Iron Peak, which is where I had my little sandwich hiking with my wife a month ago. So, I mean, there's a cr incredible sure. local local application. So, uh, I don't know. We'll get more emails about, from folks. And they talk about the Josephine and the, um, yeah. the Ingalls yeah. and the Ingalls, right? Yes. Parts that you've already discussed, but we were kind of left open-ended in terms of what they were. It, it's it's an interesting paper. So yes, I think we're setting yeah. that aside. I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm rethinking. Maybe we do that next. I mean, if we're already on this Rangelia story, I'll have to decide before uh, our next show on Wednesday. But this is great. Thank you for coming in on a Saturday morning into school and doing this. And I'd love to have you back sometime. Yeah, love to. It's great. It worked fantastic. Happy to okay. do it. Did you want to say anything to the... Too. You want to say anything to the viewers before you say goodbye? Uh, thanks very much for your questions. They're really good questions. I've missed probably 80% of them. So I'll read back through them just to see what they, what they are. And I'm okay. sure they'll come up again. They will. 
<laughs> All right, man. All right. Have, have a good weekend. Okay. Thanks a lot, Jerome. You too. Okay. Yeah, you bet. Bye-bye. Okay. The maiden voyage for a live guest appearance. I'll do just a couple more quick questions and I think we're done for today. But let me, uh, you're all saying thanks to Jerome and that's really nice. We'll try three more, how about just you and I. Uh, Brandon, the flood basalts in Eastern Washington are the same hotspot, right? But later, um, we are gonna be, so that's it. So thank you, Brandon. That's a vote for, I think what I had in mind before we visited with Jerome. My plan was next time I see you, which is Wednesday. So those that didn't see this at the beginning, um, Brandon, a vote for doing this, what was my original plan. The next time I see you all will be uh, Wednesday afternoon at 2 p.m., November 24th. And if I stick with this plan, we will be talking about the Yellowstone mantle plume. And most everybody agrees that it's the Yellowstone mantle plume that built Silesia and is now, of course, beneath Wyoming. That's, that's an idea. The Yellowstone mantle plume building Silesia has, has grown uh, in popularity among geologists in the last five years, I would say. Um, so that's a vote to jump to Silesia but a vote to flip-flop these and to kind of do question mark Rangeli. I don't know. What do you think? Do you think, we, do you think our next show should be following up with Jerome's stuff that he was just doing? Or do we kind of study uh, Seletia because it's well-behaved and more recent and we know much more about Seletia and then jump back to Rangeli? I can see arguments either way. But yes, that's, that's, that's true. And you're like, oh, I can't, I can't, what? Yellowstone and the mantle plume and, and which one are we talking about? Which ocean plateau? That's why I'm here. I can try to come up with ways to keep us uh, semi-organized here. You can see how easily you can just drop right down into the weeds and have just paralyzing effects of all this information. So my main job is to kind of keep us moving in a particular direction with some storylines and some gimmicks and that sort of thing. I was going to say something there. What was it? Um, can't, can't remember. But it was, it was uh, you know, uh, me thinking down the road a little bit and helping us realize how we can continue here. What was I um, Okay. Uh, I'm looking for one more question and we'll quit. North Scani Nerd, could the basement part of Lips be due to subsidence? Like, I was just taking some quick notes. I don't know if they're very helpful, but, you know, Jerome had his flood basalts, that's the sponge cake part of Rangelia. And then here's this basement rock down below that none of the rocks are talking about a mantle plume here. So I'm stuck with this. I, I, I was kind of nudging Jerome a little bit, like, how do you teach this? Is this, a, is this a volcanic arc with two ocean plates and subduction and a trench, and we make the islands, and, and all these rocks are telling that story fine, but then as, as uh, whoever, uh, North Scani nerd says, so then do we what? We, we kill the subduction, we subside everything, we, we sink it, and then we bring in a mantle plume to, to do this? Yes? Okay, well then, how is that physically possible? <laughs> how do you go from this to then suddenly, okay, we're done with that, and now we're going to just, somebody turns on the acetylene blowtorch and starts blowing a hole through the middle of it. Is the mantle plume drifting? Is the trench drifting? Are they both drifting? It's like, again, you can get caught in these rabbit holes where you just never come out. So I'm basically a, I'm a lifeguard. I want to keep you out of the deep end. Yeah, I'm a lifeguard. I'm not like built like a lifeguard anymore, but I'm a lifeguard. I want to keep you from drowning. What a hero. A toast to you.
Thanks to our first guest, Jerome Lessman, geology professor at Vancouver Island University. Here's to you, Jerome. Here's to you for tuning in live with us today or watching us after the fact in replay. Here's to your health and the health of your family and friends around the world. And finally, here's to all of us, old and young, middle-aged, all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of abilities, all coming here together to spend a little time in a space and a place that hopefully feels welcoming and comforting and stimulating. Thus concludes session C called Oceanic Plates. Tune in next time when Nick and the gang discuss something on Wednesday, November 24th, 2 p.m. Pacific time. Thank you. I love you. And goodbye from Ellensburg, Washington, USA. He reaches for the laptop. He hovers over end stream. And he's going to hit end stream with his left hand while he blows a kiss in his right. Kiss and stream. And can't do anything with my left hand. Goodbye. <laughs>